local Jenks, local Jenks conjecture for Arthur Petras. So uh, please trade him. Thank you very much. Thanks the organizer for inviting me. I mean, I, I can see you on, on the, your small boxes and I wish I was there to shake your hands. You have done a great job with running this conference in the middle of all this being stuck in boxes. You are doing a great job. And I mean, it was a very nice gathering for Steve's lunch yesterday. I was hoping people would be eating something, but nobody did. So I stopped eating myself, but I mean, it was a very memorable gathering together. Well, let me say a few words about Steve. We go back, as I said yesterday, to Institute for Advanced Study, 1975-76. That was the first year I met him. We were together. There were a bunch of other people. I think I remember Nori was there. I mean, Milicic was there. And there were some, you know, some of my uh, classmates from Hopkins. I mean, sure that they are no longer in mathematics, but they are doing much better than us in terms of making money. And they are retired. We haven't retired. That's another problem. And the, 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 the thing is that it was a very nice year. We got to meet all these big shots. That was the year that the, I think people, I mean, the faculty members were told that you should talk to the younger people. Younger people come here and they have no, I mean, they feel they're lost and isolated. They have no idea what's going on. So people were going around and trying to talk to us. And I remember Andre Bay was going around and trying to talk to us. I think, Steve, you remember that Andre Bay was going. I think he talked to you. He talked to uh, me. He talked to uh, my, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, how are it to student of Yusa. And then that was when we slowly really got to know each other. It was a great group of people. They're still my close friends. And Steve is probably the closest from those gangs. Steve and I traveled a lot. As you can see from this picture, we were together in Göttingen. This was 1988. And we, it was very nice. We stayed there. I mean, that was the first time I was in Göttingen. And I think from our group, Wolf's version was also there. And then the problem was that at the end of the week, the two weeks conference in uh, Ann Arbor in Michigan was starting the Mill Clausel conference, which was supposed to be some version of Corvallis. So we had to go back. And so the last day on Friday, we took a long train ride, I think it's four or five hours to Frankfurt because the, our flight was the next day. They made the hotel reservation for us and they told us, don't get off the hotel, just go there stay there and get off in the morning and go to the airport. And we did that. Fortunately, hotel had all kinds of it. And, uh, it. and then we got to Detroit. Oh my God, that was the hottest air I have ever been. And people who were in that conference remember that it was, I mean, it, as good as the talks were, very unpleasant weather it was. The second one, the second picture that is here is the, comes from the ICM, the year 2002. We were all in China and there was this conference in that, uh, at Hangzhou in that center of Yao. And it, that, that picture is the opening ceremonies of that, uh, of that meeting. And you can see we are, I mean, dressed up. And, uh, and then, and this is Mary France with Neros, which you all probably know by now, anyway. Yeah. And, and that was another experience we, we, we went Tonghai was around and he took us to the lake there and, and uh, all, all, all that very interesting occasions. And it has been, it has been really great. To, I have been with Steve to over Wolfhog many times and I, we walked together and I'm not as good as, I mean, he was very, in much better shape and I, he would go, walk with me as it was told yesterday. And he's a wonderful guy. I'm, 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 I, I hear these talks and I realize how much he has done. I thought I knew it, but I now know that he has done a lot more than I thought that I have. I have had all this great respect for him. I even have much greater respect for him. And I think I'm wishing you to work. I mean, I've been, your energy is amazing. I'm always noticed that and I'm glad that you're doing so well. And I look forward that you do another at least 10, 20 years. And if I'm alive, I'll come to your uh, I'll come to your uh, birthday conferences. And it has been great to know you. I'm, I'm proud of you. 
All right, I think now I can start talking about mathematics that I wanted to discuss. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Boeing Liu, and uh, I made some, I gave a talk like this in uh, Lumini, but I made some changes, not much for this uh, conference. It's something that uh, uh, we are both very interested in, and, and we meet every week on Zoom, of course, and try to make progress. It's, it's a hard conjecture, and it will take me a while to explain what it is. And uh, I will have to talk also, I mean, about the auto packets and parameters and all those. So I'll, I'll, I'll move slowly since there may be people here which are not really experts of these things. Now, my interest on these things when Boeing came to Purdue and we started talking to each other was the, some work that I did in, uh, in my 1990 annals paper when I uh, sort of formalized this conjecture that every tempered L packet has a generic component in it. And at that time, I, uh, at that time, I did not mention anything about the uniqueness. Other people added the uniqueness uh, when you fix a uh, additive character. And anyway, that's the conjecture. What we noticed that when working on these things that we really need an enhanced ver version of that, that we could prove under some conjecture that we make. And that would be try to put the L packets, L packets in the context of eight A packets of Arthur, which I'm gonna explain. And talk about, I mean, these are again, this is a local problem. So these are again, finite sets of representations whose characters I mean, in a way that you can manage to the character become stable. They are no longer tempered ones. So you just don't add up. And, and if you have a A packet, and if it is, I mean, if it is tempered, then it would be an L packet. So the, the enhanced version is that an A, A packet is tempered if and only if it contains a generic member, meaning the one which has a Whitaker function. So if I say tempered, that means that an a tempered L packet, so that, that would be the conjecture in 1990. But you go the other way, that if it has a generic member, that A packet has to be tempered, has to be an L packet. Now, the tool in attacking the problem that we chose is a mixture of local and global methods. I mean, the global part comes from using character identities of art. So I, uh, I'll, I'll try to get to that in, uh, slowly and uh, uh, hopefully explain things as, as, I, as it needed. I mean, uh, we take mentioned the, the Harish Chandra house character expansion. Uh, I mean, it's usually called Harish Chandra local character expansion expansion, but clearly when you read the paper, the effect of Hall's ideas and, and the conjecture and all that are there. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and it is just formulated for any reducible admissible representation of the F points of the, of the group G. I mean, F is a piadic field. And it says that there exists a neighborhood U of one of identity, such that for any function, smooth function of compact support in U, the trace of the pi of f, you integrate f against, against the representation, trace of that can express as a linear combination of uh, Fourier the transform, I mean, uh, orbital integral of Fourier transform over unipotent orbits, unipotent orbits. It already reflects in, in uh, Shalaika's uh, uh, orbital integral GM expansions when you express the behavior of the uh, semi-simple orbital intervals as you approach to the singular points. As you approach the, to the singular, uh, semi-simple singular points, uh, you have to be, it will be affected by the uh, behavior of the orbital intervals, nilpotent or unipotent orbital intervals. It is some reflection of that. So let me explain the terms in here. First of all, you have to, I mean, you look at the, I mean, F is a function on the group. So you make it a function on the real algebra, F tilde by composing with its exponential. Then you take the Fourier transform of this on this vector space V of G. And then, uh, then you integrate it over the unipotent orbit, unipotent orbit O. And so D mu of, of U is just a measure on the, on the orbits. Now, this, these are the objects that appear here. These, these are numbers. I mean, these are in, in principle uh, complex numbers, but we know more about them in certain cases. 
And what we will be dealing with are the so-called, I call them wavefront sets. So wavefront set of pi is a set of all the nilpotent orbits of highest dimension. That's how I'm going to define them, not all of the things that appear, but the ones of highest dimension for which the coefficient is not zero. So this is the, this is the, uh, the Arshandra Hall character germ expansion for a reductive. Now let's see how, how it fares in, in, in the context of the introduction that I gave through that uh, temporal air packet conjecture. Now, this says that if you have, a, I mean, in fact, Mugilan and Walsberg just showed that if you have a generic representation, the wavefront set would be a, would be a regular nilpotence. I mean, you wouldn't have, I mean, those coefficients cannot be zero. And therefore the conjecture, the, the enhanced conjecture says that non-tempered A packets cannot have regular wavefront set. So their wavefront set must be non-regular. They must be starting from uh, just below the regular one. Now, what Jung conjecture suggests is that they should be, I mean, they, they, what they should be in, in given Arthur packets. I'm gonna define Arthur packets, just don't worry, just be a little patient. So the behavior of, I mean, the Arthur packets, of course, they were generalization of L packets. It was Arthur's idea to try to extend that idea to every uh, representation, not just the tempered one. And uh, let me just specialize to the case of interest to us. When G is SP to N, of course, the L group is SO to N plus one of C. We work over C for the L group. And then this, as, the, as it is with the Langmans parameters, Arthur defined his parameters. So these are homomorphisms from the WF, the Weidling group at F, two SL2s, first SL2C and the second SL2C. And these maps go to SO2 n plus one of C, so they're orthogonal maps. They become a direct sum, I mean, of the homomorphism phi i times these two representations, SMI and SNI. And the, if I have an SLL, the L is the, SL is the L dimensional irreducible representation of, uh, of SL2C. Even any, even any, integer, positive integer, uh, there is a unique irreducible representation of SL2C and that would be the SL will be coming from there. So in particular, first of all, the phi i of WF must be bounded. And these two pieces, these two pieces here take account for the tempered space, tempered part of the packet, not the packet, but tempered part of the parameter. And uh, clearly the sum of these ki, mi, and i must be equal to 2n plus one. Now, to this, to this object, to this uh, Arthur parameter, there's attached a very important, there's attached a very important Langlands parameter. And that we denote by phi psi. Phi psi is just, a Langlands parameter should be connected to the first two factors, phi i times smi. And that is, you just evaluate it in these two parameters, W of X, but you will have a, a non-tempered contribution. You want the third component to be this, this matrix, diagonal matrix, absolute value of W to half and absolute value of W to minus a half. And this will be then, therefore this will be a non-tempered Langlands parameter if N i is bigger than one. As soon as the dimension is bigger than one, this is going to be a non-tempered uh, Langlands parameter. And this plays a central role in, uh, in uh, understanding Arthur parameters and, uh, and also in understanding what we're going to be doing here. And then when you have that, then you can evaluate, then you can evaluate your uh, phi i, SMI, SNI on these three coordinates. And that's what we will get. You will get phi of W, SMI, and then this thing, and you write it, it will be just like this. And of course, as I said, this part will give you a tempered representation, and the other one produces, I mean, I mean, I mean on the GLN side, at least on GL plus one side will give you a, a, a Langlands quotient, and that will give you the representation on GL2 n plus one parameterized by this, this, this parameter. So let me start talking about that. So I have this auto parameter, it's going, as I said, it goes to SO2 and plus one and C. So this Langlands parameter attached to, by the way, this phi psi going to psi, this is an injection. I mean, there is an injection from psi 
to inside the language parameters. So psi to phi psi is, so phi psi is very important in determining psi and determining the corresponding act. Now I have phi psi. Phi psi is a irreducible, ad admissible, unitary self door. I mean, this gives me an irreducible, admissible, unitary self door representation of GL2 n plus one of F. It's a homomorphism in two GL2 n plus one of C. So I'll pick up this thing. And this is the beginning of Arthur's idea, trying to classify representations of the self-dual representations of the classical groups in terms of the representation. Uh, I mean, the representations of classical groups in terms of self-dual representation of GLN. And he has done it very successfully. It is done also for, I mean, he did it for orthogonal group and symplectic groups and their inner forms, but now it's extended to cause a split version and mark and I'll, I'll explain and, in the, for unitary groups and the inner forms by others. I'll, I'll explain as I get closer to this. Now I need some notation. Let me assume n is a natural number, a positive integer. Let me define this. Uh, I need a, a second diagonal element. What this does, it takes the standard automorphism of GLN and makes it to be in a form that fixes the given, I mean, upper triangle uh, splitting. So it fixes the, I mean, uh, unipotent upper triangulars. And so what it does, we have this standard auto automorphism of GLN. So it's G going to G transpose inverse. And you realize that this is not gonna fix the upper triangle, it's gonna send it down. So what, what to do, uh, you know, these things are only, these things are only unique up to inner automorphism. So we compose them with this int of j, j, j tilde, and that will be just kind of conjugated by that. And that will then fix the uh, upper triangles. And then using this, we define this disconnected group that uh, Arthur used to uh, do the, uh, I, mean, I mean, use that and the twisted trace formula to do what he did to, did this, to do this classification. So then we have this action, and then we can look at this disconnected group, G, plus g tilde plus of n is just g of g, this is gln times this set semi-direct product with this theta tilde. And we know how the theta tilde acts as I explained up there. And that decomposes to two pieces, the identity component, and then the other component, the bi torsor, that is just gn times theta tilde. And we will be interested in representations of this object. And that's how Arthur compares this uh, trace formula with the, those of classical groups. Now, let me assume, let me assume I have a irreducible, admissible self-dual representation of GLN of F. Now, this is, as I said, one would be the one we just discussed up there. Then because of self-duality, you have an, an, a unique intertwining operator between pi and its, uh, its contravariant. So we denoted by, we denoted it by pi, pi tilde of N, we respect the notation. Now, this allows us to extend the representation pi to the, the, to the full disconnected group by taking, putting the uh, action of the theta tilde, which comes through this intertwining operator. Now, then you can restrict it to the boy torsor, so you will get a representation of this point. And now realize, I mean, remember that we attach to this psi, this, uh, this Langlands parameter phi psi, And then uh, phi psi will give us a representation of GL2 n plus one of F. And this will be an irreducible unitary self dual representation. And we then extend it and restrict it. So this would be the, uh, the pi psi tilde would be the restriction to by torsor. So we have two representation. We have pi psi and we have pi psi tilde. This one is on the uh, GLN part. The other one is in the other connected component. Now, now, if you are using the trace formula, you have to work with functions. So you, you will be comparing the orbital integrals and all those objects on different functions. And uh, uh, so let me take H, H of N to be the Hecke algebra of the GLN. So a smooth compactly supported function. And then the classical group that we will be working with is just SP2N, although I mean, you can do with other ones, SP2N plus one, 
And a short one, but the a short one would be a little more tricky, but the short one plus one should be rather similar. Then we define Heck algebra of G is just the, all the smooth compactly supported functions on G of F. Now to compare the, to do the trace formula, to compare these objects, you have to, you have to uh, use, a, compa you have to compare orbital integrals. Now it turns out to, to define the so-called transfer factors and to uh, do things, it's better not to take any semi-simple, but the so-called strongly regular semi-simple conjugacy classes. Now, these are elements whose centralizer is abelian. If you have a semi-simple, regular semi-simple element, the connected component of the centralizer is torus, but you need something more, more, more specific, and you want really the centralizer to be abelian. If you read, read uh, caught with shell stud, they will give you examples when you have to really make this assumption. Now, these, these are conjugacy classes G in G of F. You want to look at them over the algebraic closure. You, you put together, so you take a strongly regular semi-simple conjugacy classes, which is stable, meaning that under conjugation by G of F bar, the, the conjugacy class is sent to each other, sent to itself, and that's called stable. And then a stable one becomes a disjoint union of these non-stable one, not non-stable one, just but they are still going to be strongly regular ones. And then how do we how do we really do the comparison? We have to attach and you start with the representation in the Heck algebra of G, and you look at the normalized orbital integrals of this function. Normalized means that you take a discriminant of gamma. I mean, gamma is a semi-simple element. I mean, it's an element in the group. It has a Jordan uh, uh, form and it has a characteristic polynomial, and the leading term gives you the discriminant, and you take square root of that. And the, the, then you multiply that by the uh, orbital integral over the orbit of the element, either gamma, delta, whatever you have. And that's the notation for FG. So FG is a normalized orbital integral of F. And then you sum it up. So you have, your, I mean, you start with a stable one, gamma, which goes down to these deltas. So you sum it up, you, you sum it up over all the gammas, which the, appear in this uh, decomposition, and that will give me the, this function Fg of delta. Now, this is again Arthur's notation. Now, and I really, I'm not gonna use much of this, but the, this is the space of functions that you'll be dealing with. Now, to do anything using the trace formula, you must have, at least in the, in the endoscopic cases, uh, you, you need to have this conjecture which originated by Langland and Shellstad and then Kotwitz came in and Shellstad and Kotwitz did the disconnected uh, groups and generalized what Langland and Shellstad did. And that is done in the following way. Usually you have a group and you have a bunch of endoscopic group. Now, in the case of a, I mean, twisted endoscopy, again, you have a group and you have a bunch of twisted endoscopic group. Now here the group will be for us will be GLN, or GLN 2N plus one, whatever you have. And the endoscopic group would be this G, one of these uh, SP2N, SO2N or whatever, or SO2N plus one. Now, to, say, to explain their conjecture, you start with a function in, you start always in the big group, the function, uh, Schwartz, I mean, uh, 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 ACA function in the first group in GLN, and then you demand that there, there should exist a, a representation, a function f in h of g, a, a function on the smaller group, smaller in the sense of dimension. The real groups will be embedded, but not the groups themselves. And in such a way that this f tilde and f have matching orbital integrals. So let me tell you what do I mean, matching in what, how do I go from uh, objects in GLN to objects in SP and GL2 and plus one say to be object in SP2N. And this is done by looking at this map. You look at, I mean, I'm, now I'm taking a pair of any uh, group and any endoscopic group of that group. So an H and G, you need a map. There is a map, which is, which I think they call the image map is going from the set of the semi-simple, all the semi-simple elements of H over F bar to all the theta twisted, I mean, theta conjugacy classes. So these are conjugacy classes 
And these are community classes, but they are tailored to the community classes on the, on the other group. So you start with the uh, endoscopic group and you go to the big group. You go to, so from a speed to end, you go to the big group. And then the, the relation is delta goes to some element gamma tilde, not gamma tilde, is a tailor twisted, stable, whatever in the, in the GL and over F bar. And this map is called image. And there is a kind of inverse to it, which is called the norm map. Now, delta will be called the norm of this gamma tilde. You started from here, you went to here, and this will be called the norm of this. Now, the, you built the normalized intertwining, I mean, you know, the normalized the orbital integrals for both of them. This time on the GL uh, end part, it's the twisted uh, conjugation which comes in. So, integrity over twisted currency orbit. And for GLN, there is one. So, you will write it like this. On the other hand, you will write the, you will do this sum. You will look at this and you will do one that these two guys match. You want even. F tilde, you want to find an F so that these things match. This F is not unique, but it's unique up to functions whose, whose stable orbital integrals are zero. And if you have to add, I mean, you, you have to know if delta is a no, it's not a norm, then you want that FG of delta to be equal to zero. So this is the, the this is the fundamental conjecture that, that, that they made. And of course, uh, Walsh-Berger, I mean, in, in just a regular endoscopy, Walsh-Berger reduced it to the fundamental lemma and then go proved it. So this is this was taken care of, as you all know very well. And then uh, these things were also extended to twisted cases by the number of experts, Namun and uh, Chudwar and people, other people involved. Now, with all this said, we have to see what are what are the tools we're going to use. Arthur used these things. He he looked at the stable or I mean a stable trace formula on GL n or GL two n plus I mean two n plus one if you are comparing with sp two n and the regular trace formula on sp two n. And he used using the trace formula and using the global tools. He found uh, local identities between characters of different representations in here. Now. If you remember, I just mentioned, uh, I just told you about this uh, Arthur parameter here in, 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 in this setting. And then I haven't said anything. What is this good for? What Arthur did, he further defined, defined finite sets, finite sets of representations of this uh, G of N, and the group is G of N, we find a finite set of representation of this group G of N, which you call them, uh, and uh, I mean, we call them Arthur packets. And then the character identity that he proved is that if you take this function we started with in this uh, Hecker function, we started with, and this means just take the trace of this, but the representation is the representation of the torso. So when you, when you compute the, the action of theta, we're coming, so you, this means this. And then you express this in terms of the linear combinations of the traces of these representation pi in this finite set. So we have these finite sets of representations which you determine uh, via its trace formula. And then you, you, you take the, the character of, for each, each pi in here, you take its character, you take the trace of pi of f. So these are the elements which go in here. And then what are these coefficients? These coefficients come from the, these coefficients come from the a pairing that exists. There is a duality between you take the centralizer of the psi and you divide it by its connected component. And of course you divide it also by the center. That doesn't matter if you have SO2 and plus one, but then you take this group and this group is in duality with the elements inside this, this uh, auto packet. So there is a duality between S and pi tilde of psi, and this is the duality. And we sort of uh, simplify this. We're just going to have only this uh, S psi showing up. And S psi is really the value of psi at one and minus one, zero, zero, minus one, this, this element. And of course, we know how the parameter acts on it. So we basically have to look at the action of the, we have to look at the action of the second SL2 on this that uh, could worry us. Now, let me change the notation a little bit. 
let me put AI, which was the to equal to KI MI. Remember, one was the dimension of the uh, the part to the uh, the wave group. The other one was the first SL two, and then NI would be the dimension of the second representation of the second SL two, and then so this part phi I tensor SMI. If you look at it, I mean, it will give you, I mean, a tempered representation of GLAI of F. GLAI of F. And then, <coughs> then this, this, uh, this uh, auto parameter basically gives you some of such representations. And this, these are the, these are I mean these tie bi's are spay type representations. There will be a quotient of you will take tie would be the tempered one which comes from the first two parameters, and you put it in the in this uh, spay type uh, presentation, and then you look at it's it will be the uh, it will be the quotient of that that will be a representation of gl two n plus one that we are interested. In. Now. We want to now put these auto parameters in, in the language of uh, uh, nilpotent elements. That's how we'll be connecting to it. And that's how it is in, the, in, in a lot of literature, in particular in Jung's article in Piotrowski's volume, uh, Contemporary 614, that I'm going to uh, talk about later. And that's how he started this conjecture. And so, if I look at these, if I make the assumptions that these BIs go decreasingly, B1 is bigger than all the way to a BR, then you look at, I can look at these things and write them in the form of a partition, B1A1 all the way to BRAR. This is a partition of 2n plus 1. So this data that I have, this auto parameter can be given by a partition of 2n plus 1. Now this partition is of course something in GL 2n plus 1 C. So it's a partition in terms of GL2 and plus one, but of course we know it is orthogonal because it was going to the, it was going to the uh, SO2 and plus one of C. Now, and then remember we had the, this parameter Psi, we attached to it this partition that now produced. And of course this partition, you can look at it just like a young diagram. I mean, it will have A1 rows of size B1, A2 rows of size B2 and so on. So it will look like a matrix if you want to. And then we start with this thing, and we have peep size. So this is this is this is a, a orthogonal permit, a orthogonal uh, partition, and these are usually denoted, I mean, by a Collingwood and McGovern by P one of two n plus one. Now, what we need to formulate uh, Jung's conjecture is the barbash wogan duality, which is well explained in a two thousand and three paper by Achard. So this is defined as follows. And this is what Jung used to formulate his, uh, his conjecture. And, and, uh, and since every talking here has to justify its connection with Taylor correspondence, uh, if you look at that paper, I mean, the major contribution that the DOA did is he also connected all these author packets and so on to how duality, Taylor correspondence, the Kudla's work and Radis and many other people. So it is, I mean, these things come from the same source. So that's, that's at least one justification uh, for giving a talk in this conference. I don't know if that was the reason I was invited. And anyway, there is a so-called barbash wogan duality from the, these partitions, I mean, the orthogonal partitions here to orthogonal, to simplicity partition in here. Now it's denoted usually by this, G check here would be the Lie algebra of SP2N, and G would be Lie algebra of SP2N, and G check would be Lie algebra of SO2N plus one. So we are moving from part partitions in SO2N plus one to partitions in SP2N, because after all, we want to get representations for SP2N. Now, so how do we determine, how is this given? It's a, a simple way of defining it, what is this thing? Uh, the nice thing is that this image, there will be all special orbits, and you start from here, you process to, you do three uh, steps. First of all, you transpose this, uh, you transpose this partition. So if you look at the Young diagram, you will have A1 times 
A1 rows of size B1, and then you transpose that, and that you take that, and then what you do, you look at the last row and you take up one element from it, and I'm gonna do an example. And then you're still not necessarily a partition for SP. I mean, in particular, the, I mean, the odd elements should appear with even multiplicity. So you have to go down. So you collapse it down to SP. So you go to the one which is just below it. There is an inclusion between the potent orbits and, and that's due to closure inclusion. I mean, you look at the orbit, you take its closure. Something is less than equal to the other one if it is in the closure of that one. And there could be orbits which have nothing to do with each other. And that's a problem. Now, let me at least do this, uh, this example. Then P is B to the A, just a pair of uh, just one partition of Pn, P1 of 2n plus 1. AB has to be equal to 2n plus 1. So this will tell you that A and B both have to be odd. Now, A of P, we go with this formula. You do the P transpose minus an SP2. And first of all, P transpose will send BA to AB. The next one, you have to take off. You have to take off from the, I mean, you write all these rows, uh, you write A rows of size B, I mean, B rows of size A, and then you take off one of the, you, you just get rid of one of those boxes in the Young diagram. So it would be an A, a I mean, you're going from two and plus one partition to, to two and partition. So you get rid of this. So now this will be a partition of two N and it will look like this. So this is that thing now. The question is that, do I have to collapse here? Do I have to go down? And in this case, we do not need to do that because both A minus one and B minus one are odd, are, are, are even. And what we have to worry is we have to worry if the odd, uh, this is odd, so we have to see it's multiplicity to be even, but fortunately it is. So this odd part of the part partition appears with even multiplicity. This one is already even, we don't have to worry about it. So this is already SP2N partition. So this is this will be the representation which connects to this will be the one of interest. All right, I just repeated this in here. <laughs> Again, as a multiplicity is even, we end up exactly with something which doesn't need any collapse. Now, one thing that you could prove, one thing that we could prove is that we could compute the wavefront set of that representation of GL2 and plus one of pi psi, not the torsor but that one, and the, the wavefront set of that is given by the partition P psi transpose. You do that, you will find this, and P psi is in, is in a partition 2n plus one partition. We look at it just as a GL 2n plus one. And of course, uh, this, will, this will, how did we prove this? We rep represented this as a full induced, and we used that this thing is a induced partition and we, we proved that. So that, that was the first success we had. We had to use it, I mean, some other people's work. And then let me at least tell you what is Jiang's conjecture. Now, Jiang tells us what we should expect Arthur parameters and Arthur packets look like. So we, we start with a given Arthur parameter psi, and we look at its, its Arthur packet. So this is pi psi tilde, is local Arthur packet attached to this psi. Globally, I mean, they, they are infinite. I mean, a set will be infinite. And sometimes it's easier to prove, uh, I mean, to prove Jiang's conjecture or some papers of, I think, uh, Jiang and, uh, and Boying that they prove cases of this. And, and also something with seven they have. Now, the first part of the conjecture is that if you take a representation pi in the auto pack, so pi is in pi psi tilde, and then you take any P in the wavefront set of that pi. This basically tells you that the wavefront set of pi or wavefront set of the whole packet basically has to be bounded by this uh, Barbash-Wogen lift of P psi. I mean, we had the uh, parameter psi, we take the partition and we lift it uh, from the, the SO2n plus ones to SP2n and you would want, and you would want the, part, the, the element in the in the, front, in the wavefront set of every representation in here, be bounded. So this would be an upper bound. And this is, of course, in terms of the closure inclusion. So as I said, if you have two orbit, one is less than equal to the other one, if it appears in the closure of the bigger one. And it could also be expressed in terms of the, uh, in ter in terms of the ordering of the corresponding partitions.
Now, the second part is that there is at least one. There exists at least one pi in the in the outer packet. So it's a really a statement about the packet. There is at, at least one when this thing appears, when this thing appears in its wave front set. So there is at least one with this property. Now, the way we prove it, we do a comparison and we use that character identity. And one thing that we notice we need is the following. We try to prove it. Uh, we have not been successful yet. So we will find the wave front set of that representation of by torso pi psi tilde. And the claim is that it's basically the collapse of the one for pi psi down to SO2 n plus one. So you come down. Where does SO2 n plus one comes from? Now, first of all, you can tell me what do you mean by the uh, by the wave front set or this disconnected object? You look at this thing by means of characters expansion of disconnected groups. And that's the Clausel uh, proved that the same identity as the one that uh, Harsh Chandra character expansion gives you for the disconnected group. This was used by Kona and Walmart to prove uh, cases of uh, different conjectures. And then you, this basically means that all you have to do is to take the other one and collapse it down. This is a very useful conjecture for us. So we clearly see that as Arthur did, as Arthur understood representation theory of the classical groups by going to GL2N, these questions can all be reduced to understanding what happens at the level of GL2N. And this is quite general. You can take a, you can take a disconnected group and you can take the, you re realize, I mean, the, the, when you do this thing, you'll be comparing, you'll be really going to the fixed points of theta and fixed points of theta are just gonna be SO2N plus one. And that's how, so the, if when you write a disconnected character formula, it will be expressed in terms of the, uh, in terms of the represent, I mean, in terms of the data on SO2 and plus one, which is the fixed points of data for us. And this can be general, can be formulated in general for any, for any group, any disconnected group. Now, let's see what we can prove. The first thing that we proved, we assume this conjecture. So we assume we have some information on the level of GL. And we also assume this S psi, remember that was psi of one uh, and then uh, uh, one and then one minus one zero zero minus one and let's assume that this is equal to one then we showed that if i take anything which is bigger than which is bigger than this uh barbara bound then it cannot be in the it cannot be in the reference set of the packet it's completely out the second theorem that we proved we made this more clear. We assume again the information from GL2N plus one, the conjecture two, and let's assume all the BIs are odd. That automatically will tell us that the size is equal to one, because if BIs are odd, you'll be dealing with the even symmetric powers and the image of minus one, minus one will be one, so you don't have to worry about that. Then we can really compare the characters of, of the two sides. Now, there is a problem which arises that uh, you cannot avoid, and that is because you may have orbits which have nothing to do with each other. You could have in the wave front set uh, orbits which have nothing to do with each other. It, they could be totally independent. They could be one could be not. I mean, in the in the inclusion kind of, in the relation that I discussed, but there is a conjecture of uh, Kabanaka and Van Waltzberger that when you group them together over F bar, there should be a unique orbit. So all, all the important orbits in PM of pi should belong to a unique orbit on F bar. So this automatically says that that doesn't happen. So that sort of removes that, that possibility. So then if you have these things, if all the BIs are odd and we assume the information from GL2 and plus one, uh, and of course this conjecture, then, then the bar, I mean DOR's conjecture is valid. Now the, the second, <coughs> theorem, the next theorem that we proved. Now, assume that the, remember the order that I gave to this thing was B1 bigger than equal to B2 all the way to BR. Assume the least one is uh, AR is equal to BR is equal to one. And everything else is even. So assume we are in this setting, of course we are in SO2 and plus one setting. So we will have an odd one. If we assume everything is even, so assume that odd one is just one. 
Now again, assume the information from GL is okay. And so on the, on the GL2N, we know the conjecture two is valid. And assume that this, uh, again, the story holds that there is no non-related orbits. Now again, you have to this time, you have to still assume psi is equal to one. We are working to remove that condition. Then Gion conjecture is valid. So this is the, uh, and this is the, uh, this is what we can prove in terms of these. And let me outline the proof and then I'll give you an example at the end. So how did we try to prove these things? We, first of all, constructed a representation of sp2 and f in the L packet of five psi. Now in the L packet of five psi, we produced this representation sigma and we used some early work of uh, buying Liu. Now, then we determine, you have to determine the wave front set for pi psi and pi psi tilde. Now, pi psi tilde is of course a representation of the torso. And for that, you can only do it conjecturally. We haven't been able to prove it. So that would be vis-a-vis -vis this conjecture, conjecture too. Now, if you have this parity condition that we said that it, they are either even odd or they're even, uh, even, uh, even then, Except for I mean for one 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 uh, B one I mean B R and A R, then the barbash rogue and things will belong to P sigma. Now P sigma is not the wave function in the sense that I define. It's all the partitions. It will be all the partitions which uh, for which the coefficient C of sigma is not zero. Now, what what we need is we need really to show that this thing is a wave front set. I mean, it, this is this is really maximal. So that is that is the next step to show that this the Barbash Rogan image is a way in the wave front set, and this will of course this will give the part one of conjecture, uh, Jung's conjecture. Now to do that we have to do the following steps. The first thing is that we have to prove that we want to do comparisons. We're going to match, I mean, functions, uh, expand the functions with a parameter. So we need to show that the dimension, sp2n dimension of the, of the sp2n dimension of the Barbash-Rogan partition is equal to SO2n plus one partition, keep side trying. Remember, this was, this was the parameter for the, for the torso. And this is an SO2n plus one. And when you look at the, when you look at our character expansions, you will be in one side, you will be having things for the speed twin, and the other side, you will have a twisted uh, part, a tw a twisted character for GL2 and plus one. But the twisted character, as I said, can be written as the, as a, it will have a, a I mean, it will have a ca local character expansion in terms of the representations of SO2 and plus one. So that is, that is how SO2 and plus one comes in, and that's what we need. This, this is it. This is a, Long lemma, hard lemma. Uh, and the next thing is that we try to put these things together. Remember, we had the character identity. Let me just go back to that. Let's see. Yeah, we have the character identity. In this side, we have the twisted character for GL2 and plus one. In this side, we have this sum, and these are in terms of sp to n. So in this side, we use this Clausel expansion and write it in terms of a germ expansion, a character expansion, just like this, but for SO2 n plus one. Now, so we, that will tell us if you want to compare the, the two character identities, we need to have a matching of dimensions because then when we change the function to the function f sub t squared, some function with a uh, real, I mean, with a parameter f star, then we can do really compare. The, these are, I mean, standard ideas. Now, I use these ideas in my annals paper and I came up with an endoscopic, I mean, with an inductive proof of the, uh, tempered L packet conjecture, assuming that it holds for the endoscopic groups, then it holds for the bigger group. But the only trouble that you cannot avoid is that there will be a big one. And the big one is the one which does not come from any endoscopic group. And those you have to 
really compare with other things. So for GL, you will compare the, with unitary groups and you have to use base change. So things like that to prove for the, uh, for the packets, which do not really come from below. And we use that kind of arg argument and we use, of course, the conjecture too, which, which is I mean, the, the whole thing we can do. Now, <clears throat> and this, this will let us to show that this is in the wave front set it's, it's in maximal, but again, modulo the possibility that these maximal orbits do not get, go together. So there will be unrelated ones. So we have to get rid of those. Now, let me do an example. Let me assume B1 is equal to three and A1 is equal to one and tau one is a uh, trivial representation of GL1. And let me assume all other BJs are equal to one. Now, and assume the conjecture two is valid, then we wanna show that you can check and see that the Jones conjecture is valid. Now the partition is three, one to the two and minus two. And if you compute this, you have to go through these steps. You have to transpose, you have to take a one and you have to collapse it down. When you transpose it, it will become to three, one, two and five. I mean, it's very easy, you just do the Young diagram. And then this will be two and minus one, one squared. And you have to take a one from this. So you get rid of this last one. So it just becomes two and minus one, one. Now, <clears throat> two and minus one, one cannot be in SP2N because there are these odd parts of the partition which do are not appearing with the even multiplicity. So it's collapse is gonna be SP, it is two and minus two and two. And this will be the subregular uh, orbit in SP2N. Okay, so the, when we start with this partition, we will end up with the subregular orbit in SP2N. So we only, we wanna show that this is the dominant one. So we only need to show that no generic member appears, as I said, with that enhanced uh, L packet conjecture. And that can be implied, conjecture two implies that. So our conjecture two also proves that enhanced uh, generic packet conjecture. And therefore we have all the tools that we need and this will tell us that the, the thing, the subregular one, so it really proves the Jones conjecture when the Barbash-Wogan thing goes down to subregular one. Now, one thing that uh, we kept using here was that we use disparities, even all even or all odd. And that really is a problem. Let me take a partition when this doesn't happen to it. I mean, I like this, big, this is a big partition, but it's, uh, I like this one. So let me take this partition and let me first of all transpose it. I'll get this 13 squared, 11 cube, and so on. And then I have to do, I have to take one from it and I'll do that. You just change this to two. And then you have to collapse it down. Then you collapse it down, this becomes this. Now this is every odd thing is appearing with even multiplicity. So you're, you're, you're really in SO in SP2N and that is, that is the ADA. Now, the problem is that we computed this representation sigma that I mentioned in the L packet of five psi for SP2N. And if you compute the, if you compute the, uh, the partition that that gives you, the partition would be that you have to take the uh, special orbit over this partition. You have to take the special orbit over this partition. And, and, and that, if you compute, that's equal to this. That's equal to this. And this is strictly less than, this is strictly less than this ADA that we found in here. And therefore it shows that you can, you can have this thing which is, is not really the dominant one that we want. So it is, appears that we have to, I mean, improve upon the choice of the representation that we did or the choice of the, uh, the permutation of it that we used. Now we use a lot of, let me give you some re references. We use, use the, a lot of, uh, local work of Gomez, Gurvich, and Sahi in their 2017 paper. This is this was very helpful. We also used this paper of Jiang, Liu, and Sabin in 2016. And finally, Dion, I mean, Dihua's conjecture appears in contemporary math 614. I think uh, Jim Cobb, well, an audience to review, uh, edited that. It's a, it's a nice volume. And again, it, that's where he has a very long paper. I mean, 80 pages or something. And that's where he talks about the uh, theta and uh, all the relations of these author packets to theta correspondences. 
and so on, and uh, and uh, Kudla's work uh, and rallies, and it's a, it's a beautiful paper, but it's of course as usual it's long, but that's that's where these the, my talk may be connected to okay, the correspondences. It's clearly it is clearly there that the author packets are very abstract, and you have to put them in some way that we can understand them in terms of representations and. That, that paper does quite a bit towards that understanding. So we really understand the, uh, the, the structure of this local, this local, and of course it does a lot of global stuff too, uh, these local author packets. I think I'm pretty much done with what I wanted to say. So happy birthday, Steve. I'm delighted to be here. Okay, thank you very much, Ferdin, for that wonderful talk. Uh, please join me in. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Okay, well, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Frieden again for his uh, exceptionally clear talk. Thank you. Um,